Welcome to Real Physics. This is my series about great physicists and one of the most important figures of course is Paul Dirac I'm going to talk about today. I call him the taciturn genius who turned against the mainstream and uh, well Dirac didn't like to talk. People were saying that the only expressions he used was yes, no and I don't know and there would be a lot to tell about his infancy and his father who forced him to talk in French and but well we have to focus on his scientific achievements and one of the most important things uh, happened when he was a young student age 23 at the time there were two competing versions of quantum mechanics Werner Heisenberg had developed his matrix mechanics and Erwin Schrödinger had the ingenious idea of a wave function, but these two versions seemed to be totally incompatible at the time. And uh, Schrödinger and, and Heisenberg didn't like each other's theory, by the way, but Dirac managed to prove that they were indeed the same thing. So this was an important problem to be solved at that time. And soon later, Dirac went ahead and tried to generalize uh, Schrödinger's approach, which was non-relativistic, to a relativistic version. So what he did is, um, substituting in the Schrödinger equation, which you see in the middle, the energy term E, by a uh, relativistic expression below. And, uh, well, now very interesting things happened. Mathematically, you arrive at structures which you cannot describe any longer by reals or even complex numbers. It just doesn't work out. So the very interesting thing here he discovered was an algebraic structure that seemed to describe spin, the, the mysterious property of electrons. And well, the question remains if this is a unique consequence of the theory because already in 1843 William Hamilton had discovered a similar mathematical structure with unit quaternions and so I'm going to talk about this in another, another videos in another book uh, this is a very important discovery about the structure of space-time you need very sophisticated algebraic relations but if we come back to Dirac's original motivation which was to calculate the mass of the electron. His approach did not work out because if you put in this relativistic expression in the Schrodinger equation, it turns out that there would be solutions with a negative mass, which makes no sense. And people were reinterpreting as negative charge, but this is at the very end another thing. So we can say that Dirac with respect to his original motivation to calculate the mass of the electron failed. I mean, this is a very profound riddle of nature. Why, if you consider the, the proton mass and the electron mass, why is one thing uh, so much heavier, 1036 point something? And uh, these are the, the, uh, the kind of profound questions Dirac was interested in. And he was not so much interested in other numbers like the muon mass and the tau mass and so on. And in fact, as his biographer says, he saw no pros prospect in engaging in the physics of other particles until the electron was well understood. So uh, this remained his um, most important goal with respect to microscopic physics to calculate the mass of the electron and the proton and to understand it and he was interested always in numbers 1836 is such an unexplained number but as you know also the fine structure constant 137 is such a mysterious number in physics and uh, Dirac was sometimes very impatient when people were not interested in the same way as he was and there is an anecdote about two young physicists approaching him oh professor Dirac we have a new theory and he rudely interrupted sorry but 
can you calculate the fine structure constant? No? So come back when you have done it. This is one of the profound mysteries of modern physics and I might also quote Richard Feynman here. It's one of the great damn mysteries of physics a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. All good theoretical physicists put up this number up on their wall and worry about. This is sometimes what you would like modern physicists to do. It's not always happening. And uh, well, Dirac, as I said, he was pondering the problem of the electron mass. And the fundamental problem is here that we have three laws of physics which are contradicting each other. We have Coulomb's law of electrostatics, uh, which specifies the electric field. So then we have the energy density of the electric field in the middle. And of course, we have Einstein's famous E equals mc squared. But actually, if you calculate the energy density of a single electron, and if you put in the electric field of Coulomb, you arrive at an infinite energy and that would correspond to an infinite mass. That obviously makes no sense. And uh, Dirac was very clear to express that. And uh, so he spent some 10 years later to, um, to figure out how he could develop a proper model of the electron, maybe with finite um, with a finite range, but he did not succeed. But I mean, there was another solution which was called renormalization. And the thing is quite absurd, frankly, because the, the line of reasoning is this. Well, we have this infinite energy and we have this infinite mass, but it doesn't add up to the finite mass of the electron. So people came up with the so-called solution, well, there is a naked mass and there is a calculable mass and if you subtract these infinities, you end up, wow, well, with the right number here. That's not only ad hoc, it's also a little bit insane. And um, whatever accuracy is now claimed for the, uh, for the consequences of this theory of electrodynamics, I mean, it contradicts basic logic and Dirac was was very outspoken about this and this is what I, I appreciate very much he said this is just not sensible mathematics sensible mathematics involves neglecting a quantity when it turns out to be small not neglecting it because it's infinitely great and you don't want it and uh, well but uh, think about this so-called renormalization is at the foundation of modern post-war physics, okay? So you can't do any modern theory without that rather insane assumption of subtracting infinities, yeah? And, uh, but nevertheless, the theory was established. But Turek said renormalization in quantum electrodynamic is a drastic departure from logic. It changes the whole character of the theory from logical deductions to a mere setting up of working rules. So this became almost a, a modern religion. And by the way, Derek was an atheist. He said, if you're honest and scientists have to be, we must admit that religion is a jumble of false assertions with no basis in reality. The very idea of God is a product of human imagination. And Wolfgang Pauli, who always quipped, uh, commented, there is no God and Dirac is his prophet. But Pauli, however, agreed that uh, this problem with the electron was really not solved. And in his Nobel lecture in 1945, Pauli said that a satisfactory theory should not lead to infinite zero-point energies. That means he also considered it um, an absurd system to, uh, to deal with this renormalization process. And Pauli also said, we will be considered the generation that left behind unsolved essential problems such as the electron self-energy. Well, this is unsolved 
and uh, maybe this frustrating situation also led direct to shift his interest to another field which was emerging at the time cosmology um, in 1937 he came up with a very very interesting thought which is called a uh, large number hypothesis this is the original article and you remember um, Dirac realized that one very important thing in fundamental physics is to understand numbers such as the proton electron ratio such as the fine structure constant but there is another huge number if you calculate um, the ratio of the electric and the gravitational force in the hydrogen atom and uh, you end up with an incredible large number 10 to the 39 almost 10 to the 40 and uh, well Dirac was desperate he saw no solution to this problem but in the 1930s the first measurements came up of the size of the universe and so the thing Dirac w observed was if you divide the size of the observable universe by the size of the proton you end up with a similar huge number of the order of 10 to the 40 so this was very intriguing and uh, people people know about this uh, coincidence but there is another coincidence which is striking as well and if you have two of these striking coincidences well it's really hard to say it's just uh, it's just a random coincidence if you divide the number of uh, the uh, sorry if you divide the mass of the universe by the mass of the proton which is basically the number of particles in the universe you get to the number 10 to the 80 which is the square of the other mysterious number 10 to the 40 but look these are independent coincidences because you simply could construct a universe with he heavier particles and just less particles so you would have the one coincidence but not the other but uh, the fact that you have two coincidences is really remarkable and um, Dirac said that it reflects a deep connection between cosmology and atomic physics well I have made other videos about um, this Dirac's large numbers and has very interesting consequences for cosmology but I want to focus on one point here in his article um, there is also a model of the universe in which Dirac assumes a non-uniform expansion okay and since the universe is expanding with the speed of light it's also something that points to a non-uniform speed of light and Dirac did not explicitly talk about the variable speed of light but there is a very interesting connection to an idea of Einstein in 1911 about variable speed of light and uh, unfortunately Dirac did not know about well Einstein in short was assuming that the well-known light deflection in general relativity was caused by a lower speed of light in the vicinity of masses well the tragic thing here is that Einstein and Dirac they did not talk about their best ideas Dirac did not know about Einstein and Einstein never realized that uh, that Dirac had developed a very a very similar theory there is a book about uh, this stuff but uh, the, the essential point here is that you have a system of variable quantities that might govern the laws of nature and uh, you can set up a consistent system of speed of light wavelength frequency and so on all is changing and it's all consistent with this uh, hypothesis of large numbers by Dirac Dirac also explicitly said that it is usually assumed that the laws of nature have always been the same as they are now there is no justification for this the laws may be changing and in particular quantities which are considered to be constants of nature may be varying with cosmological time such variations would completely upset the model makers well uh, in his first article in 1970 in 1937 Dirac talked about a variation of the gravitational constant and this variation has not been observed 
but as I said if you go to a system with variable quantities that uh, change of the gravitational constants may well be hidden in the change of the other quantities so the issue is not resolved and it's very still very intriguing that um, Dirac's large number hypothesis is indeed compatible with that Einstein idea of formulating general relativity with a variable speed of light and I also have a another little speculative video about uh, these large numbers and the monster group mathematicians may appreciate it but let's get to the general perspective here I think Dirac is famous for the things he maybe not like that much himself in his later career such as the Dirac equation also it, it led to important discovery about the structure of space-time and uh, he was certainly frustrated about uh, quantum electrodynamics but what can we take from him for the modern problems of physics and the most important problem everybody's talking about well quantum gravity and because the two formalisms of general relativity and quantum mechanics are literally incompatible like fire and water and uh, people are talking a lot and writing a lot about uh, approaches to quantum gravity there's a vast literature but I mean if you if you look at the numbers and, and if you want to be quantitative okay and physics is quantitative Dirac's idea is the only reasonable approach here because look at the system uh, look at the, uh, the simplest quantum system the hydrogen atom and compare the numbers we have the the electric force and the uh, gravitational force and then you arrive at, at this number 10 to the 39 I mean whatever theory of quantum gravity you want to come up with you have to produce this number otherwise it's just babble okay so uh, I made another video on this and uh, the other thing is that modern physics is very different from the approach Dirac has taken I mean he pondered over the fundamental questions why is the proton so much heavier than the electron and Dirac was determined to look for proper solutions he called it sometimes beautiful theories which is not exactly a good guide for for physical theory I think he should have considered simplicity rather than beauty and actually it was simplicity he was after when he said I want to derive uh, these two particles I want to understand this number 1836 okay so he had a completely different mindset how to discover physical theories and you see a profound gap between uh, the physics Dirac was doing and what is called modern physics this is a standard model of particles and I think uh, with this huge number of elementary particles Dirac would have been disgusted of, of modern physics and actually he was quite isolated in his later life he found a position as a professor in Florida and died there in 1984 but uh, let's say since the 1940s even earlier he wasn't in the mainstream of physics any longer he was considered well a very brilliant guy but he had already done the most important work well maybe not I think Dirac is appreciated for some things but more important I consider his contributions to cosmology with the large number hypothesis and his search for simplicity and uh, elementary particles as I said he was quite isolated as others of his generation Schrödinger and Einstein I call this the geniuses in scientific exile and well that's one of the developments we observe we see a remarkable shift from 
the physics of the beginning of the 20th century where people were after the fundamental laws of nature asking these profound questions about mass of elementary particles and the post-war physics that just produced new particles and uh, baptized them with fancy names and and just uh, try to try to get theories working but without that profound questioning of the basic laws okay um, I have a paper about uh, Dirac's aspects of cosmology and uh, some of the things I said is also in my recent book the mathematical reality I hope you appreciate this video about Paul Dirac don't forget to like it and if you're interested in fundamental questions subscribe to this channel